Welcome to today's webinar compiled and produced by the team at Okay, and here we are. Thank you very much to the panelists um, who are going to be presenting this morning. And these, this is the beginning of a series of webinars hosted by Biz News and uh, in arrangement with Deloitte South Africa. And they are based on reports from Deloitte Insights on the digitization of government, not only here in South Africa, but across the world. So lessons to be learned there. I will be talking to Khabar Tabani, the director and uh, the director of government and public service industry, Deloitte Africa. He has 20 years public sector working experience and has been in consulting for just over 13 years. Currently, the government and public services industry leader at Deloitte Africa focusing on innovative solutions for the public sector, especially the provincial sphere of government for maximum service delivery, clean governance, and accountability. And he's been involved within the public sector um, in the development of the Youth Economic Participation Strategy, Northwest Province, member of the Provincial Tender Board, leading to Infrastructure Portfolio Committee of the Board, and head of the Northwest Provincial Trade and Investment Promotion Agency. And this happened uh, between 2003 and 2009. His colleague is the Digital Transformation Strategy Lead at Deloitte, Andrew Johnston. Andrew leads the Digital Transformation Market Offering at Monitor Deloitte Consulting. And he rejoined the practice after seven years building businesses in the fintech, ad tech, and prop tech arenas, merging them into a consolidated investment group focused on disruptive and innovative business models. Andrew has deep experience in customer acquisition channels and strategy, building out end to end systems and process to drive optimization and incubating growth through a developed analytical and decision focused approach to problem solving. And he's won many hats over the past decade, including entrepreneur, shareholder, director, partner, and consultant. He's a big picture thinker. We'll be painting some of those pictures for us later on in his uh, presentation, right? <laughs> Andrew, we'll be hearing from you, and uh, we'll be critically identifying original solutions based on long-term desired outcomes. He'll be giving a presentation shortly, as I indicated. Dr. Tina Becker is the General Manager, IT and Knowledge Management at Rand Water. And he has more than 21 years experience in the ICT arena in financial, logistics, telecommunications, and water utility, utility sectors, including both private and state-owned enterprises. He holds a master's degree, PMP certification, and ITIL foundation certification. He's a member of the Institute of Directors of South Africa and an associate member of the Government IT Officers Council. Also has experience in non-ICT areas, including business process management, project office management, facilities management, risk management, and records management and knowledge management. Becker is responsible for the management of information, including records, business processes, and underlying ICT system solutions and ICT infrastructure in support of Runwater's strategic objectives in line with the governance framework. Morgan Padayachi, also member of the panel, manager innovation and technology at Runwater, is currently responsible for innovation and technology at Rainwater is indicated and has an in-depth knowledge of both the developing as well as the developed markets having successfully executed uh, projects in the African continent and involved with numerous collaborative studies globally. His experience as uh, acting managing director of Rainwater Services, a subsidiary of Rainwater, business unit manager, technology management, innovation, development manager, scientist, uh, biotechnology, knowledge of engineering solutions, utilities, water industry, the pharmaceutical industry, as well as rainwater, enable him to articulate clear and compelling strategies geared at driving growth and sparing innovation and sales within the organization. Now, this is how it's going to work. In a short while, as I've indicated, we're going to hear from Khaba Tabani, who will be making some opening remarks, and then we'll hear from Andrew, who will present the topic for today, accelerated digital government, making some comparisons between countries around the world, but particularly reflecting on South Africa as well. And the Rand Water representatives, Sinas Becker and Morgan Parayachi, will present or share with us their uh, experience, you know, case study type experience in the form of the panel discussion. And um, uh, Andrew will also be taking part in that discussion. 
I will be moderating as indicated, and I'm also asking those attending this webinar to start sending us your questions. I have not extended welcome to you, but I appreciate that you have made the time to be with us this morning to learn together and share experiences. You don't have to just send questions. You can also share with us your experience. If you are in the public sector space in particular, uh, tell us what your experience has been in terms of this morning's uh, topic so that we can learn from you as well. So that will happen in about 10, 15 minutes from now. I will be giving members uh, of the audience attending this webinar to share with us their own experiences. Are we all okay and ready to go? I'm, I'm ready to go. Are we okay? Of course we are. Kaba, let's not waste time and go right to you. Welcome, Kaba. Thank you, uh, Ramudise, and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome everybody attending this webinar. Uh, it has been long coming, and we really appreciate having having you here. And uh, my word of welcome is basically to sketch a quick background on what this webinar is all about. It was launched about five years ago by our Global Deloitte Center for Government Insights and it has focused on the ongoing transformation of government. Now, every year over the last five years, various trends have emerged on what is happening in government and how government is dealing with various challenges uh, they are meeting. These trends are, in, are actually informed by research surveys and our own work as a firm in the trenches with government worldwide, not just here in Africa or in South Africa. So they provide a unique horizon uh, of uh, scanning capabilities within uh, uh, the government. In 2021, we have emerged with nine trends, all in all, uh, that you know, have been highlighted through this uh, research and survey process. Now, three common things uh, come out of uh, the process and what we have seen. The first thing is that the trends focus on the operations of government as opposed to policy issues. So it is work on the ground and where we believe uh, the tire hits the road as far as government service delivery is concerned. The second thing is that every trend has moved way over the pilot phase and actually um, is at the, the point where it penetrates what we call the heart of issues uh, for, for our uh, public sector clients. And finally, all these uh, trends that we have identified in our report of 2021 are global in scope and they cover and happen in both developed and underdeveloped countries, and they do so in various degrees. Now, we are in this engagement to look at what are the implications of these government trends in 2021 in South Africa. And we hope that uh, in the subsequent years, we'll be able to take a look at these trends across the African continent. So yes, I've spoken about the nine trends. What exactly are they? I'm going to speak about the nine and talk about the ones that we have chosen for ourselves and particularly the one that we have chosen for this particular web nine engagement. The nine trends include accelerated digital government, seamless service delivery, location liberation, which is, by the way, the future of work, as uh, we have seen, um, uh, you know, where government had to adapt workplaces, fluid data dynamics, government as a cognitive system, agile government, and how it responds quickly to the needs of um, uh, citizens, government's broader role in cyber and cyber security, particularly the whole cyber ecosystem, inclusive equity-centered government, as well as sustaining public trust in government. 
So in South Africa, we chose out of the nine, five trends. Today, we are dealing with two of those trends, and they are government in the digital space and how it accelerates digitalization, especially in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as government's broader role in cyber, how government adjusts itself to help secure the cyber ecosystem. So welcome everybody. I do hope that uh, we will enjoy, you know, sharing ideas on what these, these two trends mean to our government in South Africa today, how far we are aligned with the global thinking on where government should be moving as far as these trends are concerned. As uh, Ramudisa said earlier on, we will have uh, the other uh, three webinars that will deal with the rest of the trends that we have identified as relevant to our environment. Mr. Murise, thank you very much. And once again, I really would like to welcome everybody with the hope that we will really enjoy uh, engaging together on these topics. How about thank you very much uh, for the opening remarks. Much appreciated. And Andrew, we will hear from you now and uh, post your presentation. We'll have a panel discussion. So there you go, Andrew. Thank you, Tim, and uh, a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, if I could just ask, please, if you could put the, give the presenter capability to Eric, because uh, he will be showing the presentation, which I'll be running you through. Is that possible? Just very quickly. As uh, they are giving the, the presenter privileges, Andrew, would you please uh, uh, introduce Eric to uh, the webinar and the panel? Thank you. So, so Tim, I'll be giving the I'll be giving the, the talk. Uh, Eric will just be sh sharing a presentation on my behalf, and I see it it's now up. So, um, as as earlier, my name is Andrew Johnston. I am the lead digital transformation uh, market offering leader within Deloitte Consulting, uh, and today I'll be taking you through some of the government trends uh, as highlighted in our imminence work. Next slide, please. Right, so we are living in unprecedented times of change uh, and the digital age has brought with it uh, massive amounts of, of, of uncertainty as well as uh, significant opportunity. Uh, products that we used to use when we were younger, video cassettes, Walkmans are, are now completely archaic. Uh, and you know, what, when we used to go to the, uh, the, the, the store to get uh, a video uh, and from Blockbusters, that has now become Netflix. So it's an entirely new digital, environments. Retail has become e-commerce and ordering food uh, as, as a simple example has now become a double click. And, and so as time progresses and the rates of change increases, the driving forces within the new, the new economy are compounded. Uh, and as time passes, it becomes riskier and riskier not to embrace this change in technology and take action on it. Next slide, please. So, so last year we saw something that uh, was completely unprecedented, the shock of COVID-19. The number of cases indicated here is from yesterday. A staggering, uh, over a staggering 230 million people have had COVID. And what this has done is this has rapidly uh, changed the world's economies uh, and, and you know, forced people into new ways of working, relying on remote communication, uh, circumventing the old ways of doing things. Uh, and embracing an, an entirely new virtual environment to continue as a society. This has been particularly evident in governments around the world uh, as uh, digital is no longer nice to have. Uh, it's spurred into action uh, sort of things that have never been seen before from you know, telehealth uh, kind of solutions which were brought to society, virtual courts and virtual education. Uh, many unprecedented digital transformation innovations were also rolled out across the globe at rapid speeds to account for the pandemic. Um, and as we, and if we consider um, you know, what the elements that digital helps us to enable, to be able to scale cheaply, adapt quickly, uh, and serve uh, people efficiently, these are all qualities associated with a more digitally transformed uh, society as well as uh, capability. 
Next slide, please. Right, so this is a quote that I just think sums up uh, things very, very nicely. The greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence itself, but the way uh, in which we act with it, without uh, the, the logic of yesterday. So we need to embrace doing things differently. We need to uh, understand that in times of uncertainty, we shouldn't fall back on our old ways of doing things, which we've done it for many years. Uh, and this takes a lot of courage and conviction, but it's certainly the only way forward. Uh, and and, and it, as digital transformation is not a once-off uh, thing, it's a continuous iterative journey, uh, increasing in velocity over time. Uh, it's, it's, it's very important that we all get on the bus and we embrace uh, the new digital elements which, uh, you know, and the capabilities which this enables us to provide to not only uh, our people, but, but everybody around us. Next slide, please. Right, so in order to in order to do so, right, and this is the way that we think about digital maturity at Deloitte, right? Uh, it's understanding uh, our capability uh, when mapped across the various stages uh, and various di dimensions uh, across an organization. And we measure this typically across five pillars, customer strategy, technology, operations, as well as uh, an organization's culture as well. And governments need to move from doing digital uh, to where many uh, enterprises get stuck, uh, in, in, in this loop of an illusion of being digital uh, and doing digital at a relatively high level, to being far more digital, uh, to moving to an operating model and customer model uh, that optimizes for digital and is profoundly different in the way that it adds value to the customer proposition, the operating model, as well as the customer models. Next slide, please. Right, so just very quickly, I think, uh, what this slide looks to do is just outline the, the digital transformation is, is not just a nice to have, it's actually really good uh, for, for business and that translates also into government. So uh, typically there's a high correlation between, uh, you know, co cost efficiencies, better service, employee engagement, uh, growth and innovation, uh, as well as enabling efficiencies uh, when we look at a higher maturity uh, digital, digitally transformed organizations compared to those uh, with a lower digital maturity. But this relates into, in a business context, into profitability and cost savings, but I think it, 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 overall efficiencies and optimization can be seen across the board with a, a better digital transformation uh, adoption. Next slide. Great, so becoming a, a truly digital um, government requires the development of a broad array of assets and capabilities which we term digital pivots. So effectively applying these pivots results in government services that are, you know, core ca can be characterized more by, by being digital as opposed to uh, doing digital. Um, so there, there are a number of different initiatives on, on, this, on this particular slide, and it's quite a, a wide spectrum. I'll look to focus uh, particularly on those that were called out in the eminence piece and in our, our current thinking, but also touch on the others. And the first, I think, is the flex is a flexible and secure infrastructure in order to scale. So, in order to you know allow for uh, widespread adoption, uh, cloud is is a critical element to enable organisations to scale rapidly, uh, to ac access content, and to provide services remotely. If you have your architecture on premise, this is uh, can be very limiting, and it's critical also uh, to have cloud in order to enable the level of security. Uh, that we would require in order to, to provide the service uh, the way in which we would like to do so. Also, the volume and the speed of uh, the remote workforce, which was uh, required uh, by the by the ontake of the COVID pandemic, uh, allow we, we, you know the, this this future fit architecture would allow for this ability to scale uh, on very short notice and also to accommodate many people working from many different destinations as well as being able to access data. Uh, that is centrally available uh, and i think you know what's what's critical is is understanding that you know this capability uh, is, is is simply a question of of the application of uh, the right priority uh, you know the right skill sets uh, and, and making sure that we're you know we're able to uh, understand where, where we need to be from a, a an ambition perspective uh, in order to provide the services that we want to um, over the coming years the second, uh, I think, which I'd like to highlight in the, and is called out in the eminence piece is the a digitally savvy and open talent network. So having technology alone is not enough. Uh, and we need to build out a fluent digital workforce that can enable the transformation journey. 
Uh, focusing on training and upscaling and retooling is an essential part of the process and being able to adapt to the new ways uh, of working. I think also, you know, the way in which we look at talent is also important. Uh, a lot of these digitally uh, savvy skill sets uh, are now gig workers, if you like, and they work on demand. And so we need to be able to adapt to this way of working and, and be able to harness the, those skill sets in order to help us to, to move forward uh, and to you know, get those skills that are critically scarce in those particular areas. Data mastery is another, another critical element, uh, and that's our ability to, to fully leverage the data that's at our disposal and have this centrally available. Uh, you know, this will allow us to provide more customized service, a, a better user experience, uh, and also to create efficiencies in the way that we deliver our services. Better leveraging ecosystems, so bringing together the partnerships. Uh, this allows us to not be, you know, have to be the best at everything, but allowing for people to specialize and we can collaborate and partner with people uh, in an ecosystem and platform uh, approach, allowing us to better organize ourselves, um, you know, from a tech architecture perspective as well, in order to integrate and leverage uh, the capabilities of all the players in the ecosystem. Better workflows, so uh, from an automation perspective, recalibrating the processes, the, the free up time of, of a lot of our critical resources uh, in order for them to focus on the work that's of, of higher value rather than uh, the more menial administrative tasks which, which can be automated. A unified and consistent customer experience, I think uh, a lot can be said about that and it leans obviously, uh, of course, on the data, the centralized cloud solution as well as the architectural themes, allowing us to have these data points in one, po in one place uh, and so that they can be fully uh, leveraged uh, and organized accordingly. And then lastly, uh, innovation. And so allowing us to do things a little differently, uh, using technology to unlock business new model, to, to unlock new business models uh, and ways of serving our clients. And uh, to, to some of the points earlier, I think a lot of countries all over the world are, are, are spending uh, billions of dollars uh, around these key initiatives. Um, France, Spain, the UK, Singapore, just to name a few, uh, and this is enabling them to, to, to tackle these problems in a more agile fashion, uh, allowing them to use these pivots to, to help them to digitally mature their capability as well as their service delivery. Um, and this is a trend which I uh, anticipate will, will, will continue uh, for a long time to come and, uh, and increase over time. Thank, Thank you, you, Tim. Back to you. Sure. Then thanks, thanks very much, uh, Andrew. Let me bring in uh, Tina's and Morgan uh, to come in here. Let's talk about your experiences within your environment on the back of what we've just heard from Andrew there. Starting with you, Tina, the role of digital technology in your operations in the rainwater space. Tell us a bit more about that. Thank you. I think in order to understand the, the full scope and appreciate it, uh, there is, of course, two distinct areas and you have to cover both. The one is typical IT, which supports uh, the supporting processes, uh, your administrative processes, normal ERPs, uh, devices, communication, telephony, etc., which is what you expect from any type of organization. Then there's a second part that we shouldn't forget, we sometimes ignore, which is really what some would call operational technology, industrial systems, control systems, those are the, the, the technology that actually supports and enables the, the core business process in the case of utility or any other industrial organization. So I think it plays a major role, not only for the normal administration of the organization, but it also plays a major role in terms of uh, the essential service that we provide. Uh, and I think that is, in a nutshell, the sort of role that it plays, but it it's important to understand that it is a quite a wide variety of technologies uh, from infrastructure, asset condition assessment technologies, SCADA, water quality, etc., that you will, might not typically find in an administrative company like an insurance company. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Tinas. But I wonder if the you know the emerging COVID-19 situation this this past year imposed any unique challenges to your business, Morgan? If you can comment on that, I suppose instead of the normal way of doing things, there are certain things you had to adapt to pretty fast. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, and uh, happy to be on this platform. You know, digital water, smart water, uh, water 4.0, 
uh, being in the water space, you know, there's many potential opportunities um, out there in terms of uh, ability to uh, create resilience and innovation, uh, resilience and sustainable, sustainability in a water utility. COVID has certainly forced us to, to rethink our business model and, and operating models. It's opened the door to innovative new methods uh, for monitoring and managing our plants and operations, ensuring business continuity, and of course, service, uh, serving our customers. In particular, we are increasingly turned to smart water technologies, which is data-driven hardware and software to remain connected, not only to our employees within our business, but also to our critical assets, to our customers, uh, and whilst maintaining a physical uh, distance. At Randwater, we have an innovation hub, which is housed within the Randwater Institute, and we have over 100 game-changing digital uh, transformation projects, which varies from the use of satellite technologies uh, to detect leaks on drinking water pipelines to remote monitoring and management of our plants and operations. We are leveraging big data uh, to develop and have developed uh, first of its kind simulation models for water quality coming into our plants and networks. We're transforming our pipeline grid into smart grids where we leveraging of IoT and multi-sensor probes to, able, to be able to measure and monitor water quality in real time. You know, so we're leveraging on digital twins and virtual reality. So the technologies that are out there, we are basically de-risking, adopting at a very fast race, uh, pace at Randwater to ensure that, you know, we, COVID, we, we embrace the challenges that are posed by COVID and we create a more sustainable water utility. Thank you. And of course, that's within your environment. I wonder how in the interface, the interaction with your customers, the challenges, have been, I'm thinking of municipalities here, you know, that are they are they leveraging, taking advantage of your own innovations and uh, adapt the agility within rainwater? Or what is the experience with the municipalities? Uh, Tina, so Morgan, either one of you can take that question. Thank you. I think uh, Morgan and maybe talk about the innovation adoption. I think we, the municipalities got a sim similar business model than we have. So they would have similar challenges, uh, although it's at a retail level and we're at a bulk level, but essentially the service is the same. It's, a, it's a, an essential uh, service in terms of water provision. So I think the challenges they have would be very similar to, to us. I'm not really up to date 100% about each municipality and how they uh, responded uh, to, this, to this pandemic. But one would expect very similar solutions also that uh, had to be deployed in order to continue the service. Yeah, just to add to that, you know, in terms of working with our municipalities, we're trying to create an integrated model where, you know, as a bulk water utility, we supply water to our municipalities and, and directly to some industries, etc. We want to be able to ensure that we have a complete end-to-end -end view of the entire network the reservoir levels, uh, the water quality, et cetera, you know. So that integration, which we call monitoring and integration, is now starting to basically gather momentum. And soon, and soon we'll be able to see a very seamless approach from cradle to grave or source to source or source to tap in terms of water usage in South Africa. Uh, people will look at their own experiences within their municipalities. Talk, you mentioned something about the water leaks, but they, they see water leaks in, in their own municipalities or the quality of water that is compromised. I'm thinking of communities such as the one in Hamans Kral. For, for, and they might blame run water for that and say, well, Morgan, with respect to you, you talk a good game, but how come the water, the quality of water that we receive at the uh, at, at consumer level is of such lousy quality, where, where, where would the responsibility lie and is there anything technology can do to improve that situation? Yeah, of course, you know, you know, it's a very important point for us uh, in terms of maintaining uh, positive, strong agreements and relations with our customers, which is the municipalities, but also to be able to demonstrate in a very transactional, 
transactional manner that look the water we're actually supplying into the reservoir of the municipality meets the quality standards that we've agreed to certainly the internal water quality standards that have been provided by Rand Water are higher than the World Health Organization standards you know so we have monitoring points we have samplers that collect samples from the reservoirs of the customers so you know we are able to demonstrate that when we do supply water it meets the highest quality standards certainly through digital digital transformation and data analytics platforms we are able to see the clear segregation and segmentation all right and one can only hope that the municipalities are learning from yourselves as around water right and say if you are doing things the way you say you are doing and you you can demonstrate the fact that they should rather than reinvent the wheel so to speak but uh, just adopt the model or, or the way you are progressing with your digitization programs but uh, Tinas, any lessons learned during the past 18 months two years or so yes they were quite a few <laughs> in terms of looking at lessons learned i think we should start with the challenges i think we must understand that uh, to land water environment there are two, two distinct challenges they are the the people working from home for administrative processes as soon as possible but then of course you must have to understand that not everybody could work from home at a plant level there have to be people at the site for to maintain and operate the plant they have different challenges uh, in terms of, uh, of of that environment but there's still the need also there to have a more of a contactless uh, operations in terms of digital forms etc so they definitely overlap although there are the two distinct challenges the one thing that i lesson learned is for the first challenge was to respond at the time we had to respond adequately now the lesson learned from that is one it can be done <laughs> if you have adequate focus and dedication and a, and a single objective in mind the risk is that you will sort of dilute that focus again once the pressure is off the second one was that we were quite blessed in the sense that we had the right architecture, the right strategy in place already. And some of the technologies were already used, but at limited scale. Uh, so the lesson there was, it was a really a, an accelerated delivery of strategy that was already agreed to. And uh, the lesson from that is that this groundwork that we need to do, having a good architecture, good standards, interoperability, understand the strategy, uh, that is still something that, although it's old school, it should be there. It really helps you to, to respond very quickly. Uh, thirdly, we use what we had available to us, but apart from that, we also utilize cloud where it is feasible. It is really a way of getting something done very quickly. Although there are risks, some real, some perceived, uh, it still offered a lot of value. Uh, in terms of moving very quickly, getting something done uh -huh. quickly. I think the the um, one thing that we have to learn, however, from the risk side is that it was mentioned earlier, as we digitize, uh, we see an increase in cybersecurity risk. We know about it. I don't think I have to justify that part anymore. Um, but there's also a second risk that, we, that we, we've, we've seen, and that is as we digitize the business processes, it doesn't seem to be much enough emphasis on uh, digital records and how do we ensure that there is adequate admissible evidence available for assurance, compliance or litigation purposes. And I don't see enough being done about that. Uh, and mm -hmm. that is really a concern and one of the lessons learned. So if you haven't seen it yet as an audit finding at your audit committee, it's probably on its way. Uh, so, so that is something that I think we've learned yeah. we had to do quickly. And, and I appreciate that comment because, in a, in a way, it leads to the next conversation that we're just about to have uh, with the Auditor General. I'll be raising the point as well with them. And Morgan, brief comment from you and uh, Andrew. I would like you to reference any uh, global case studies briefly as well that might be relevant to South Africa. There was there is a question that I asked about the end user experience, the quality of water the, at the end of the day, respective of digitization. If you are the consumer, the resident elsewhere, and you have a, 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 a negative experience, you end up blaming it on rent water as an example. But Morgan, you go first very briefly, and Andrew, please wrap it up for us in a moment. Go ahead, Morgan. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Just to touch on the previous point about the experiences, you know, there's a few there's a few other important ones before I get to the global global case studies which we would like to share. The first yeah, one well, is I'll that I'd like Andrew to just wrap uh, that, that part for us, but go ahead, Morgan. Yeah. 
Yeah, data is everyone's business, you know. So don't have data side data silos. Um, use data to reimagine your entire value chain, like we're doing at Brandwater. What we've seen is that crisis or needs-driven innovation uh, is far more easier adopted than value-driven innovations. You know, so nothing nothing better than a than a crisis to actually spur spur innovation. We see the Internet of Things as more than just a technology trend but also now a foundational technology that could deliver material value uh, and sustain competitive advantage. So we're starting to use this um, digital technologies to create competitive advantage with, uh, with some of the players in the market. And, you know, Andrew spoke about it, but, you know, people have to make the decisions. You could have all of these technologies, but you have to have people to make the decisions. And therefore, the future skills requirements by a water utility becomes very important. Cybersecurity was spoken about. So just getting back to the global, the global landscape is, is in, in the sense of, you know, we have started to benchmark our performance against that of the International Water Association standards. Uh, they've created what's referred to as a digital adoption uh, water curve. And this maturity assessment not only provides an, or serves as, as an assessment tool, but also as a roadmap to guide utilities on moving through the digital adoption journeys, all the way from being unaware of your processes to being an agile business structure. And, and finally, from, from my side, you know, we work very closely with international and local organizations. Our ecosystem of partners and, and alliances are quite expensive. We cannot basically afford to, uh, to implement innovation in isolation. We work with uh, Singapore Water Utility, which is PUB. We work with the guys from um, Europe and, um, and Australasia, certainly to quickly adopt these technologies and de-risk any business uh, risk to man water. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Andrew. Just a brief comment from you, and we will be moving to the next session. Thank you. Thanks, Tim, and thanks, to Morgan and Tina. So, I think some very, very interesting points uh, raised there. Um, but yeah, just to round it out, I think um, just to reiterate the, the number of interesting case studies around the world. I mean, we're seeing it uh, in the U.S., uh, obviously in Europe, in Asia, uh, and it's 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 all of these topics, right? And so, you know, for example, in the states, we're seeing an increase in the, and I think maybe a point that wasn't stressed earlier around the connectivity, right? So to bring this all together, right? We want we want a population that is, uh, you know, that has access to broadband, that has access to cellular phones, and can, you know, digitally interact with with you know with government uh, and infrastructure uh, providers, uh, as that enables you know them to have uh, a very clear line of communication. Um, so I think that's one interesting um, case study. I think you know in the UK as well, there's you know a huge upgrade in the government IT. Uh, to improve security and efficiency, as well as the administration, um, something to the tune of 600 million uh, going in there. Um, and I think you know th those are all also key themes we we touched on earlier. Perhaps one other, a, a chunky one in in France, sort of an eight billion plus investment into yeah all of the elements we chatted about earlier: the digital transformation, the infrastructure, and, and also into the ecosystem and, and the startup investments. Well, thank you very much uh, to the panelists, Andrew Johnson and uh, Tina Becker, Morgan Podayachi. Thank you for sharing with us your experiences. We've learned a lot this morning regarding the digitization within the government space. Obviously, a little bit more that still needs to be done. And the fact that the consumers, residents, um, citizens will and do have the capability to interact with the different agencies of government that the monitoring of the performance of the digital assets of government can be monitored in real time and, uh, and feedback can be given by those who are the beneficiaries or recipients of such services. Once again, thank you very much and uh, also for highlighting the cybersecurity threats and risks that you mentioned. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in a moment, I will be moving into the cybersecurity space. And this time I'll be talking to Eric McGee, who is the Associate Director of Cyber Risk Services with uh, Deloitte. Eric is focused on assisting customers in innovative and targeted threat hunting to ensure timeless detection and prevention of cyber attacks. Eric McGee holds a, a, a Bachelor's of Engineering Electronics from the University of Pretoria, started his career as microelectronics integrated circuit designer and embedded system developer and later project management. Worked in the security space with BCX Group in 1998 at Nanotech. And in 2004, moved to BC Networks, assisted in studying the information security competency. He has 
managed security line of business for BCX, becoming managing executive for communications and security business there. And um, additional to his formal education, he holds a CISSP, CISA, and uh, CRISC professional qualifications. And he will be giving us a presentation in a moment. And in the panel, I'll also be with uh, Sipo Ndaba, who's the corporate executive for specialized audit services with the Auditor General of South Africa, starting his career in information technology in 93, having worked for various companies, including Sasol, Ascom, Ernst & Young, and Kijima, before being appointed partner at KPMG in 2003, where he held various positions. He has 25 years experience in information technology, and he spends across the areas of IT risk management, IT audit, information security project assurance, application development, and he joined the Auditor General of South Africa in 2018 as the corporate executive responsible for specialized audit service, which includes performance audit, IT audit, fraud, and investigations. And of course, he has personal interest in digital technologies and how these can be applied to the audit profession. Gentlemen, welcome. And let me also remind our mem members of the audience that feel free to pose questions or share your comments with us, and I will be reading those out during the uh, during our discussions. So, without further ado, Eric Menji, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Tim. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm with you. The uh, government trends report and specifically the cyber component, um, and then just giving it a bit of a South African flavor and African flavor, um, and, 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 and just giving that context. So, um, if we look at the, the overall trend globally, um, there's definitely a shift in the role that government plays, specifically because the problem that we face in the cyber space is not you know, unique to any specific sector, certainly not only in government. Um, and, and, you know, what I think governments globally have started to realize is that there needs to be collaboration both with public and private organizations, and they all need to work together to combat this problem. So, in essence, um, our government trends report has identified three sort of global trends. Firstly, I think it's this shifting in the relationship uh, that, that government holds um, that, that needs to and has started to lead the collaboration globally between different organizations. Um, and it manifests often in the, the formation of a cyber incident response team, which helps to coordinate global attacks, global incidents, um, and also then to help organizations individually to deal with what is happening, what is uh, what everybody's experiencing, uh, what those threats are and and to learn from each other and to help you know respond to those threats in south africa we have the national cyber security hub which is the csr csr um, and that initiative is 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 exactly that is to help bring together public and private organizations so something to support really from a government perspective um, you know and 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 certainly drive from the public uh, private perspective as well so that we we get that collaboration going help each other to to combat the threat that that's global and that you know is indiscriminate in many cases um also in south africa we have sabric which is really focused in the financial industry in the banking industry uh, and, and and a very good example of uh, you know where the banks of those all those organizations come together to combat fraud broadly much more than just cyber um, but certainly a very effective organization in helping each other understand, helping each other to learn from each other and, and combat the, the global threat. Um, so so that certainly this relationship change uh, in, in global trends is, is something that we see. Then there's also a change in the way that organizations and, and government organizations are, 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 are delivering or operating their, their cyber and their security activities. Um, Definitely driven to 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 a, a the concept of zero trust. In other words, don't even trust the internal users because their machines, their their uh, infrastructures could also be uh, infected or could be could be compromised. And then to make sure that every interaction with IT systems are are verified, are, are checked, and uh, are, conf are, 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 are uh, you know, reviewed in terms of its compliance with policies and updates, and and and, and that the, the right security measures are in place before activity is allowed. 
Um, and then also uh, there's a big drive towards hunting for threats. So in other words, looking into the infrastructure much more uh, specifically to see if there are any uh, compromises or anything that does impact an organ the, the infrastructure to weed them out before they actually uh, compromise or actually have an effective impact on the organizations. And then largely there's a big shift in terms of the responsibility that governments play in terms of the human capital element. There's a shortage of skills in the space globally and Africa is no different. Um, and, and globally, what we do see is that, you know, organizations, uh, the governments are really helping and driving the development of skills in the cyberspace in order to, to fill that gap um, and that demand that, uh, that, that exists globally. But I don't know about that. I think South Africa uh, specifically have a few other impacts uh, recently and specifically in the legislation space, uh, particularly around privacy. Um, Privacy legislation, the Poppy Act that have been enacted and that are active now, and the impact of breaches on private information now from, an, from, a, from a legal perspective is, is, is just different. Uh, the impact is on organizations, the, 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 the compromises would certainly impact them, you know, in terms of fines, in terms of reputation, in terms of uh, potentially even uh, jail sentences of senior officials and so forth. So it's really, uh, you know, an impactful thing. Um, I don't know about that, and also driven next to that is, is the EU GDPR uh, legislation uh, that has been in, in place even before ours. And again, it impacts when we do trade and we do interact with organizations in the European Union. And I think overall in Africa, there's a, there's a, there's a whole host of privacy legislation that are being enacted. So it's not just the EU, but even Africa and broadly and globally that, are, that, that have an impact on South Africa is also enacting the Cyber Crime Act, I and mean, it's already been signed in law into law, but it's not yet uh, um, uh, um, uh, taken official uh, um, uh, uh, been activated. But um, it's really something to to consider. The the the, the, the act uh, gives law enforcement uh, a lot of capability and teeth and processes that would trigger should a cyber uh, crime uh, be, be committed and once infrastructure can be used as part of a crime as a cyber crime without you knowing but you still will be part of that process so it's something to really consider and really understand and uh, and it just changes the way we look at this, this problem because the implications are much more severe than it would have been before these legislative frameworks were in place. Other things that are happening I and mean, we've talked a lot about the uh, digitalization drive and, and things that are changing, uh, you know, that technology adoption and acceleration of that just brought to the back surface, um, you know, and it's very much driven in, in our geography in South Africa and in Africa by the uh, by the hyperscalers, the, the likes of Google, Amazon and Microsoft that are, that are, are building presence in the country and, and, and really driving a lot of digital transformation and adoption of technologies. Um, and accelerating it because of the capabilities they offer and, and the ease of enabling them. Um, I think in general on the continent we see the adoption of, of internet connectivity and mobile technologies that enable that, uh, you know, accelerating massively and the use of that specifically in youth is, uh, is, is just accelerating. So, so another change that is, that is driving, you know, the, 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 the exposure to cyber attacks and cyber uh, impacts uh, much more. And then we've spoken about COVID-19 already earlier today, uh, but again, you know, just the workforce being moved to their homes and, you know, the, the perimeter of that network where that work completely moved outside of the organization. Um, and again, that, you know, the, the traditional protection that we, that we even have built into the IT infrastructures are just disappearing because people are now working from home. So all of these changes, um, are really just very impactful and 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 with the legislation the changes i think the you know the stakes just, just are so much higher for us um you know and, and the impact of uh, you know attacks and, and being prepared for them uh, is so much more important for us to take notice of and to implement and, and ensure that they're in place um you know in, in line with what's happening globally so with that, I'm going back to, to tim thanks very much 
And thanks very much, uh, Eric, for your presentation. Sipon Daba, as indicated, is the Corporate Executive Specialized Audit Services with the Auditor General of South Africa. And they work with different arms of government monitoring and auditing how they manage uh, public funds and implement all the laws. And of course, uh, IT systems and di digital assets are also monitored and assessed in the process. Mr. Sipondava, thank you very much for joining us. And Eric, we're still with you. Um, but I want Sipo to give us you, the practical experience in your environment as you go around the country, looking at different layers of government, national departments, provincial and municipalities. What is the situation? What is your assessment? Or be before I talk about others, let's talk about what you are doing within the Auditor General space. No, thank you very much, Tim, for, for, for inviting me, first and foremost. Uh, from the perspective, obviously, we are nine institutions. We are charged with huge responsibilities in terms of the information that we have about our auditees, which we commonly apply for protection of the information that is not in the public domain is very vital for us. And therefore, if you don't, if you don't have adequate security measures, it might lead to reputational risk as potentially sued by device that is confidential. Thank you. Well, and, and again, let me apologize for some of the technical issues we have with the sound, I, but we, we, we managed to get the, the gist of what you were saying. Um, the Cyber security in the space of your auditees, as, as you mentioned, what, 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 to what extent do you think it's a priority there for them, you know, just from your observation? Just from our observation, and we are going to be issuing a general report that is going to be focusing on this particular um, topic specifically, um, is that many of the government departments as well as entities are found wanting when it comes to cybersecurity. We have seen a number of cybersecurity incidents that came into the public domain where it just demonstrated how vulnerable are government systems to cybersecurity. Um, we have seen some small improvements in terms of the measures that they are putting in place but it's not enough to mitigate the risk around cybersecurity. And obviously, because of the sensitivity of security, we cannot name some of those entities and departments that are vulnerable to that for the risk of hackers not exploiting those specific um, vulnerabilities. I suppose another thing to consider when it comes to security, cybersecurity, um, is not only what happens within the particular department or agency, but I suppose it's the impact on the citizens that such uh, breaches may have. If there is interference, earlier we had a discussion about water supply as an example, or electricity supply, or, or a supply of any particular service. Eric, you, you can share with us your thoughts on that, that you know, uh, for, for the benefit of those who are responsible for implementing appropriate um, the security or mitigating measures that they, sh they should consider, that these are the risks that are attached to not implementing appropriate cyber security measures. Yes, that's, that's very true. And if, if, if you think about it, digital, digitization is happening in government at different levels. And, and the more automated or the automation in the environment, the higher there is from a cyber security perspective. Um, I think the obvious risk is reputational risk um, from a government perspective. And maybe it's not so much an issue in the public sector space because many of the services that we get from government are forced services. We don't have an option to. But I think more is around the, in the disruptions of services in government. We have seen situations where there's been a cyber attacks and as a consequence, the services are not available, whether it's at the metro level, that means at the municipality, where they cannot process any queries because of systems not being available as a consequence of cyber, att cyber attacks. 
and there's various examples that are in the public domain. I think the one that's more recent uh, is the Transnet uh, incident that happened, where Transnet could not carry on as business as usual for a number of days, if not weeks, and it had a very um, adverse impact on their business operations. The, the next risk is around fraud. And I think from an OTA general, it's the one that we're particularly interested in to see to what extent can an external person or a person who's not authorized to do so to perform transactions or activities in the systems that they may not be detected, but may, may, need, may lead to potential fraud. And then lastly, as we have seen, is also the financial loss from a public sector perspective. Um, it's not uncommon now in the public sector where hackers are now demanding ransom where in terms of the, just pleasing the government systems and expecting payment before they can, um, what they call, um, um, and encrypt some of those systems so that they can continue their business mm -hmm. as usual. So many of these risks are really materializing, which were traditionally in the private sector space, but they are now moving into the public sector space. Eric, comments from you? Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, thanks, you both. Uh, absolutely agree. I think um, I think there are some other factors also that that you know um, one should also consider. Um, there are a lot of nation state activity as well uh, that we see. Um, you know, and, and even though we're on the southern tip of Africa, you know, not uh, you know not necessarily that prominent globally, we do find uh, that we. we Get feel the impact of those, and, and often it's 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 collateral damage. You know, the attacks that CP talked about and the attacks that that happened, it often happens indirectly. I mean, we had uh, incidents, um, for instance, in Africa, as an example, not a couple of years back, uh, with the headquarters of the in, in Addis Ababa um, um, was uh, was sponsored by, for instance, Chinese uh, funding, and. Um, what was discovered a couple of years down the line was that there's a server that actually uploads a lot of information every evening uh, to 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 uh, uh, in in, uh, in Shanghai in China. So definitely those activities are there, uh, and and one shouldn't uh, underestimate those specifically in the government sector. Uh, you know, we potentially got sensitive information. Uh, you know that that could be exposed. But certainly, I think the operational impact now we're seeing very, very severely impacting organisations, um, and it's very much driven by the the ransomware approach, where you know information systems, everything's encrypted, and, and organisations just crippled that can't operate, and then the ransom is demanded in the back end. Great way for the uh, for for the perpetrators to monitor this activity. Um, and they're just indiscriminate in the way that they do that. So, so, so everybody's at risk. But I think, as Sipu has rightly pointed out, the services from government is forced. It's there's no other option, and and citizens are directly impacted. So the stakes are just so much higher, uh, you know. And uh, and it's, you know the the criminals are really not scared to go there and, and, and attack organisations, mm. government organisations. Well, thanks very much, Eric. And uh, Sipo, final comment from you. I want to ask, um, given what you uncover as the Auditor General and the reports that you publish, obviously we pay attention more to the money side of things and we're told there's wasteful expenditure, irregular expenditure, and probably fraud, corruption, and so forth. How much of a factor do you think is the, uh, the digital aspect or the human aspect? Which, which one do you think causes the most problems? within the public sector space. And number two, any particular advice that you would give to the auditees when it comes to the risks that we have highlighted, some of those that we have highlighted, what measures should they take to mitigate those risks? No, thank you very much, Tim, for that question. I think on your first point, um, as I said earlier on, the more you get digitized or automated, the higher the risk of cyber threats. Um, and in many cases, so while it's technology driven, but the human is the biggest factor. Um, in many cases where you found successful cyber security uh, vulnerabilities being exploited is because they explore or exploit the human factor. So it's always the people that are vulnerable or do not take enough precautions in the way that they manage the environment or the systems that they have access to. 
So that's the first point. I think the second point to your question is that from my, our perspective, there are a number of things that we're really trying to drive as part of messages to, to government. The first one is that cybersecurity or cybersecurity governance in particular is part of risk management. And risk management, it squarely lies with the accounting of the accounting authorities of those departments or boards of those government entities. And they are the one who have to make sure that they do have adequate governance structures to detect and respond to those particular risks. So that's the first one. The second one is part of governance is ready to enforce accountability. And accountability goes with consequence management. So where there's been gaps of flaws in terms of applying certain controls, we are really driving hard messages to government to say you need to apply consequence management so that you make those responsible to be accountable and take measures to make sure that those type of things do not, do not repeat. But I think at a technology level, at, an, at, an, at a much more operational level, they are really through, so to speak. For example, many of the issues that we identify are really basic things that government should be doing and are not doing. Running latest patches that resolve known security flaws in the environment. Making sure that you do regular penetration tests so that government can proactively identify weaknesses in their own systems and respond to that before the hackers have got an opportunity to do so. And we really appeal to government's internal audit functions to play a far more of a active role in identifying and responding to some of the cyber risks that are associated with their environments. So in a nutshell, those are the sort of three top things that government can do in terms of managing and reducing the risk of cyber attacks. Thank you. And thanks very much, uh, Sipo. Eric, a final word to you. Any additional advice you may give regarding uh, mitigating risks and uh, cyber security breaches? Yes, no, thanks, uh, thanks, and uh, thanks, Sipo, also for your contribution. Um, I think from uh, from my point of view, I think to add to that, I think it's um, the people problem is big. You know, it's it's an, an I think twofold. One is you know uh, just not having the right uh, enabled understanding of the responsibility when in, uh, interacting with IT systems. So there's a lot to do in terms of educating people. There's also your IT administrators and, 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 and privileged users that have access to information that are, could also become a target. So one has to think of monitoring very carefully, uh, you know, the activities that happen and that could even target those individuals. Um, I think one has to start shifting the, the approach in terms of just monitoring, but actually spending and, and releasing and, and making budget available to drive because these attacks are not happening instantaneously they typically happen over months we perpetrate our the network for you for a long time and and if we can just you know drive those threat hunting activities pick them up as early as possible and stop them i think second, lastly maybe to add is is really to focus on resilience in other words be prepared for when it's going to happen because Reality is, it's very difficult to keep these. You know, you know, if you're not connected to the internet, you won't be attacked. But if you are, the chances are there are zero-day uh, patches that aren't that are that there aren't patches available. Some of the vulnerabilities these guys exploit. So the chances are you're going, be, you're going to be attacked. So then you must be prepared for dealing with that, right? And and that's not something you want to to deal with when it happens. You should prepare yourself for it. So so spend time on thinking about and, and preparing yourself. For it. Making sure your data is back, fixing your backups so that you can fall back to all data. Because if you get a ransomware attack and everything's encrypted, you know, your only fallback is the data that you have. Rebuild the systems and go back to your data. If that data is not, is not up to date, if you haven't tested those backups and you can be able to restore them, you're going to have a big problem to get, up to get your systems back online. Uh, it might take, still take days, but if you don't have the data, it might take months. So it's really important to have that time if it up. Uh, yeah, I can't stress that. Sure. Well, Eric, thank you very much uh, for your comments. And let me apologize for the, the sound, the, the breaches to <laughs> the quality of sound. But nevertheless, I, I, I did manage to understand and, and uh, pick out what you were saying. Sipon Daba is with the, um, the Specialized Audit Services of the Auditor General. Thanks again for also participating and sharing with us your views and experiences.
within the Auditor General space. I appreciate. And this is how we come to the end of the webinar, the first of the series that we are running with Deloitte. Much appreciated to other panelists who um, shared their insights with us earlier on. But more importantly, let me thank members of the audience who were listening patiently and following these discussions. We will be having the next one on Friday, same time at 10 o'clock right here on Biz News. Once again, thanks to all and thanks to Deloitte for helping us put together this package of webinars. Have a great day.